you on the conference call yet? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Hi, how's everything with you? Good. Okay, Dave, five, four, three, two, one, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Mike. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second webinar, Connecting Logic Models to Data You Can Use. This fast for ATE project is supported by the National Science Foundation through the ATE program. The webinar is brought to you by the Evaluation Center at Western Michigan University and the Center for Program Evaluation at the University of Melbourne in Australia, which is where I'm at right now. It's about uh, 3 a.m., so bear with me. So my name is Dee, and I'll be your moderator today. And with me here in Melbourne at the Center for Program Evaluation at the University is Amy Gullickson. In the US, we have with us today Helen Sullivan and Arlen Gullickson. Behind the scenes, making sure this webinar runs smoothly, we are very lucky to have Mike Lisecki. To help you keep track of who is speaking at different times during the presentation, you can see the presenter's picture and name in the upper right corner of most of the slides. So please note that the views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Science Foundation. For those of you who are not affiliated with the ATE program, ATE stands for Advanced Technological Education. It's an NSF program focused on improving technician education in fields like biotechnology, advanced manufacturing, nanotechnology, renewable energy, and others. So when you hear or read ATE, that's what we're referring to. You can see that we are in the midst of introductions and housekeeping as it is highlighted here. The webinar then has a couple of short introductory topics. The core section of our webinar will consist of examples from an ATE project and we'll pause for questions a couple of times within that portion of the webinar. Should you have any burning questions, please feel free to pose them in the chat box. Otherwise, pose them during the breaks to allow for more meaningful discussion. Before we begin, I'm going to take just a few moments to familiarize you with some things you need to know about using Blackboard just to make the most out of our time here with us. Some of you may be familiar with Blackboard already, but I'll just quickly go over the main feature we'll be using today, which is the chat box that you can see highlighted here. The chat box is where you can type questions and comments, which you can do at any time. So why don't you have a quick try and use the chat box by telling us where you're from, and don't forget to hit enter. Awesome, that's great. Perfect, so I can see most of you um, know how to use the, the chat box now. Very good, it's lovely to see a huge variety of locations, none of which I visited, but I would love to visit one day. So I'll just quickly move on to the next slide now. The section highlighted here is the participants box. It lists everyone who is attending this webinar. You might see some colleagues that you know, and it's fine to send them notes, but you need to you should know that the moderators can see any, everything that anyone types in the chat box. You can send private messages to other participants, although the moderators will see those comments, as I mentioned before. First, you select the person's name, then their name will appear as a tab below the chat box here. For technical questions, please send a private message to Networks Admin. Okay, now let's have a quick look at the objectives for this webinar. The purpose of the webinars in general is to prepare participants on relevant topics so that the workshop day can focus on activities with and for the participants. 
This webinar is intended to introduce you to FAST for ATE and how to apply for our workshop in October and help you understand logic models, the basic components, how to build one, how it connects to the various stages of a project's life cycle from proposal to reporting. Rest assured, we'll provide a handout, slides, and webinar recording on the Evaluate website um, under the resource library page. So now I am very delighted to hand you over to the capable hands of Arlen Gullickson. Good afternoon. I had to fumble to turn the switch on. Welcome to all of you. I see you're coming to us from all across the U.S. and with the folks from Australia. It gets to be quite a span of time zones. I'd like to begin this afternoon with a bit of context. Our long-term aim is to help the ATE program identify and develop tools tools that can <clears throat> effectively serve evaluation needs for a wide range of projects and centers. Most likely I'll just say projects here, meaning both projects and centers. And I've got to turn the page too. <clears throat> In our fast four ATE efforts, we're working with you to first map our projects using logic models, then map potential evaluative activities to the logic models. At our October workshop, we will use these ideas and information working together to create high-level logic models of evaluation data needs for learning in the ATE program. Following the workshop, we'll draw these ideas together and provide that synthesis to you. <clears throat> these activities, which comprise FAST4 ATE, are the first phase of an overall effort. Phase two, which is beyond our current workshop grant, embodies our long-term vision to create a system of tools designed specifically for ATE PIs to help them harness the feedback they need for learning and day-to-day decision-making. We believe the existence of a data structure or system and specific tools will make the collection and use of critical evaluation data feasible for all NSF ATE projects. The system we've envisioned will involve resources, including a cloud database, and tools to enable data entry through multiple interfaces, including mobile applications. ATE projects and center staff who use the resources will be able to collect and use real-time data for formative purposes and roll it up for annual NSF reporting. As those of you who are participated in the first webinar know, Gordon has been looking at various ways such information could be stored, shared, and used. Our follow-up webinar materials will include a link to this video describing his work and initial product ideas. Toward this end, our work in FAST4 ATE will help us identify needs and priorities based on feedback from ATE PIs and evaluators. We simply can't begin to build this without your input. Thus, we see FAST4 ATE as a staging ground from which you and we can move forward individually and collectively to phase two. Through the webinars and workshop in October, we believe some of you will personally want to identify and construct tools for your own project. In addition, the workshop will provide the opportunity to meet and identify potential partners who are interested in the same evaluation issues. Consider evaluative efforts to serve your own project and the program as a whole. We encourage you to move forward individually and collectively with ideas in your current projects and use ideas generated for future proposals. We hope some of you will want to include us in those efforts. We know that our aims will not be fully realized by the time we complete this project, but we believe this will set us up to move forward into phase two in a collaborative way. With that as a bit of backdrop, let's focus on today's agenda. In our May webinar, we talked about four elements essential to evaluation of any project or center. Planning, resources, expertise, and timing. Though there are many ways to attend to these elements, we have chosen the logic model as our tool. Both of our webinars focused on logic models to develop a sense of comfort in language among the group of us, 
and to establish a common basis for moving forward. In this webinar, we will use the logic model to identify opportunities for developing strategies and checkpoints related to these elements throughout a program. These strategies and checkpoints will help us to ensure that we are moving effectively to gain the intended outcomes. We want you and other ATE members to consider not just logic models, but creation of core assessment tools that we can develop together, test through individual and collective project research efforts, and apply to increase formative assessment and its effectiveness in achieving intended outcomes. So, we will know that we are successful in our efforts if at least some of you take the next steps of embedding some of the ideas you see here in your current projects or your next proposal. We hope that many of you will identify aspects that you can work on collectively and that we hope that some of you will also want to engage some or all of us from past for ATE and evaluate in these efforts. Now let's turn to Amy for our direct look at our logic models and evaluation questions. Thanks. Amy, you're next. Hi, everybody. I'm Amy Gullickson. I'm a co-PI on the Fast for ATE project. And as Dee said, here in Melbourne University, where now it is 3.11 AM. So Dee and I are enjoying some caffeinated beverages <laughs> while we're having some time with you. Um, in the last uh, webinar, we covered the how-tos of logic models. So I'm just going to give a quick refresher on that. And then I'm going to provide you an overview of how a logic model can help you map out opportunities for evaluation during your project or program. So from after this short segment, we're going to move to examples from an ATE project. So you don't need to worry about madly taking notes. The slides will be available online. And we'll email you out a um, uh, handout with some helpful resources. So you might remember this graphic from the first webinar, if you attended that. We covered just the basics of creating logic models. So this is a quick refresher. These are the basic categories, needs, inputs, activities, outputs, and outcomes. And also on this has you know, some key words and questions to ask when you're putting together a logic model. Once you have the various items and the categories in place, you need to check the if-then logic, which is represented. Let me see if I can find the magic finger tool. Represented by these arrows, the yellow arrows here. So you want to be able to say, if we have this, then we can do or create this. So with these needs, then we're going to, if we have these inputs, which we'll need to conduct these activities, these activities are going to be what we need to conduct to reach the outputs, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots of different ways to draw and label the elements within a logic model. And you'll see beneath this red one, there's a purple one that I've put in, um, where they just show a different way of naming the categories. However you break down the steps and the title boxes, the thing to keep in mind is that outcomes have to connect with needs. So you don't want to ever have a logic model where those two things are separate from each other. And if you can't see the connection between the outcomes that you've laid out for your project or program to create and the needs that you've said are important for the project, then you've got a problem you need to address. So that's just the basic overview of that. Today's task is moving from that logic model to evaluation questions. So Evaluation, and we're also going to look at evaluation activities and data that can help you get the results that you want at the end of your project or program. So first, let's talk just a little bit about evaluation questions. Um, what are they and where do they come from? So um, what we've learned from the work that Evaluate has done and the work that we've done at fast for ate is that pretty often PIs leave the work of articulating evaluation questions to the evaluators rather than trying to wrestle with them on their own. And we're not saying that you should um, not engage with your evaluator about these uh, important questions. But we do want you to think about how to effectively engage with improving and adapting your projects while they're running. And in order to do that, you have to have a good sense of what it is you want to create at the end. And evaluation questions are the things that you ask to know if you did what you meant to do. So it's helpful for um, PIs and for everybody, you know, project staff, to be aware of what those big questions are so that you can be constantly saying, how is what we're doing helping us to get towards that impact that we want? So evaluation questions can really be linked to any of the categories in the logic model. 
but today we're going to focus in on those outcome questions because this is the, we're working through that if-then logic, making sure those things are connected. And we want to make sure that we're able to answer to the question, to what extent did we make or do or change what we wanted to in order to meet those stated needs. So there's always those connections between outcomes and needs. So when we talk, think about uh, evaluation activities and data, um, evaluation, that's a way to gather information about how the project is going while it's in progress. And there are lots of opportunities to do that um, anytime within the life of a project. So you can see on this slide that we've mapped out with the arrows all the different places that evaluation activities and data collection can happen. And that uh, essentially with, you know, within that if-then logic of the overall logic model helps to answer the, are we doing what we need to be doing to achieve the outcomes that we want to achieve? So today, what we'll do is show you how you can identify key spots for these evaluation activities and data collection by asking a couple of critical questions and also by walking backwards through your logic model. So that's what the um, orange arrows now on the top are about. So the, in the first webinar, we essentially did the if-then logic um, from left to right all the way through um, a, the mapping out a program. And today, we're going to do things the other direction. So we'll be talking about how do we go from outcomes back through the things we've got in our logic model to make sure that we have the right stuff in place. A key piece to remember here is that evaluation is more than just descriptive information. You have to have some judgment in there also to know how you're doing. So when we're considering evaluation activities and data, it can't just be descriptive information that you collect. But let me give you an example. Uh, it's not enough really to know how many students attended a recruiting event, for example. Um, you do need to know how many there are to get started on answering an evaluation question. But if you want to make a judgment about it, you need to know if they were the right students. Were they the ones you're trying to target? And pretty often in ATE, those are the underrepresented populations. So if you're going to get the most out of the data you collect, you have to be able to say not only how many students there were, but something about their demographics. So are they from these underrepresented populations? And, um, and if so, how many of them are from that? So that you have that kind of way to describe it. And then, you know, you may have actually set targets about how many of those students you wanted to reach. And so that's another level of evaluative information. So how many students were there? How many were from this target that you wanted to reach? And how close is that to the percentage or number of students of that particular demographic area that you wanted to meet based on what you said were the needs for that population and the outcomes that you're trying to create from your project? So that was a whirlwind tour of um, logic models, uh, evaluation questions, evaluation uh, activities and data collection, and making sure that we're actually getting to that evaluation step. So um, if this has been totally confusing, hang on, because we're going to work through some examples that will help to make it clear. Um, we've got Helen Sullivan's going to join us. And she's an uh, experienced ATE person, and we're, she's just going to walk us through some examples. But I want to take some time just right now to flip over to D. And if there are any burning questions you've got, we want to answer them now before we go any farther. So put them in the chat box if you've got them. And if we don't have uh, any questions, I suspect that Dad or Gordon will flip on their microphones and ask us uh, something to clarify things. Thanks, Amy. Does anyone have any questions at this point? I actually don't have any burning questions at the moment, so. <laughs> I, I have one. Uh, this is Gordon. Is it ever too late to create a logic model in a project cycle? I don't think so. Um, I feel like, you know, when you're, it, particularly even at the end, if you wanted to be thinking about how can you report about what you've accomplished, the logic model is a good way to show how what you've done linked to the outcomes you're going to create. So if you're going to get the most bang for your buck doing it uh, in the proposal part of a project, 
definitely makes sense, but I think it's probably still worth doing even when you're at the end. Mm. That's my two cents. Follow up to that. How how extensive or how big does your logic model have to be? You know, it really depends on what you're going to use it for, I would say. Um, you can do some real basic ones, like the ones that we've shown here um, for things with our fast for ATE project. So um, just showing kind of the high level activities and outcomes can be enough to explain to someone who's not familiar with their project how you think it's going to work. If you're using it um, as we're going to do today, if you're using it to identify evaluation opportunities and to think more specifically about how you want to conduct program activities, then a more in-depth logic model makes sense. Hey, Amy, we've got a question from Max. Sure. Who should draft the logic model, the PI or the evaluator? Yes. <laughs> I would say uh, it's really useful if both the PI and the evaluator can work together on it because the PI is going to have some pretty clear ideas about what they want to do and the evaluator can help uh, make sure that things are in their right categories and that the questions, the overarching evaluation questions that get asked actually are a match to what's in the logic model. Great, thank you. Hmm. Okay, if we don't have any other questions, let's move on to what I think is the most exciting part of the webinar, which would be having a chat uh, with Helen. So um, Helen Sullivan is an experienced ATE staff member, and we're going to talk about the ways that um, she's linked evaluations to their logic model, both to report to NSF and to improve their efforts as we go as they went along in their project. So Helen, thanks for joining us. Welcome to the webinar, and why don't you start out by telling us a little bit about yourself? Thank you, Amy. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, afternoon, and middle of the night uh, <laughs> to everyone who's on the call. Um, I really apologize for the 3 a.m. folks in Australia. I can only imagine. Um, I'm director of the Convergence Technology Center, and my background is in journalism, telecommunications, and management. And I have worked over 12 years on ATE projects. Great. And Helen's from the Convergence Technology Center at Collin College. Helen, you want to just tell us a little bit about CTC? Okay. Um, the, the college where I work had two project grants prior to the center grant in 1999 and 2002. Uh, and then we became a regional center in 2004. And we moved to a national center in 2012. And Convergence Technology is an IT foundational type program, uh, but it has a lot of nodes that work off the network, and so that's kind of the space we're in. Great. So what we've put together here is a really a high-level logic model of what happens at CTC. So Helen, if you just want to give us a quick run through, um, I can get out my handy finger tool and kind of point at things if you'd like while we go. Okay. So. Um, if you're looking from left to right as far as the need um, to have students uh, in the workforce, we do work all the way across into impact. Now today we're going to talk uh, specifically about working connections. And so that's going to be, if you want to move over to the activity box, uh, Amy, oh, you're sure. going to work backwards. <laughs> that's good too. So you go down to the activities of spot uh, in the middle where it has working connections and super faculty professional development. Uh, we saw a need for high quality but low cost professional development in emerging technology. Uh, and that's why uh, that's an important piece in our logic model to do our program. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So what we're going to do for the most part in this section of the of the webinar is dig into working connections. So what we've done is expand out the logic model. So that here again is this overall logic model for all of CTC. And you can see in the activities column here that they do several really big uh, activities. So each of these could have their own logic model essentially because they're so um, complex. So what we've done is 
make a logic model that's just for working connections because that was the way it was easiest for us to show the evaluation steps. So here is the working connections logic model. And Helen, if you want to just give us a quick overview of what, what happens with working connections, that would be great. Thanks, Amy. Uh, working Connections is a week-long training event that's held every summer. And we have um, professors from community colleges around the country who come, and they select one of it's usually seven tracks uh, to get in-depth professional development. So after they've had this week-long training, they leave with the technical expertise and materials, um, which would be curriculum, that enables them to teach these topics in subsequent semesters. So at a high level, that's what that's about. Perfect. All right, so let me take a spin to the next slide here. So you can see that from the, that original high-level uh, logic model that we had for the whole center, there are some things that have stayed consistent from that one to this one that's more specifically about working connections. And that's the uh, activity here, Working Connections Institute. That's the same, uh, the need. Several of the inputs are the same. And then, not surprisingly, things here at the end in terms of outcomes and impact. So anytime you're doing this sort of drill down process where you know, if you've, you're running a center or a project that has multiple interventions, multiple programs within the project, drilling down doesn't mean that you have to build a whole new logic model. It just means that you might have to add some pieces in and take some pieces out. So now that we've had a good look at working connections, um, I want, it would be great if in the chat box you could think about and enter some ways that a professional development program like working connections could go off track or fail. There's lots of possibilities. I'm going to put the logic model up so that you have that to look at while you're thinking about what to put in the chat box. I can see a couple of people are typing, so we'll just wait a little bit for them to get their posts up in the chat box. Remember to hit enter to show your post. Yeah. Yep. So trying to do too many things in the um, in the workshop itself, choosing bad topics, not actually making it to, to impact in this classroom, not relevant to industry. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, so not having adequate assessment, instructors not prepared, uh, lack of, so there's a few um, sort of high-level categories here, which is, uh, you know, the, the topics or the choices aren't relevant. Um, you don't have uh, trained presenters or uh, that kind of thing, you are not thinking of
Kathy, it's Mike. I just want to check. We might have did we lose your audio? Are you there? I'm there. I'm here. Okay, Alan. Hey, me, are you there? I'm just double checking on audio. I think we lost Amy. How about Helen? Yeah. I'm here. Okay, so I see that Amy is gone for a second. She's chatting back to us. Hold on, folks, while we make our connections here just a minute. So, Dee, I see that you're chatting to us. Dee, do we have audio from you? Hang on, everybody. You'll hear silence while we're just working out this audio issue. So it looks like both Amy and Dee have logged out. We'll just give them a second to log back in. Might have just been a a blip in their internet connection there from Australia. So let's just hold on for one. Australia didn't pay their internet bill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> or the electricity or one of those two. Sorry, folks, we're just making we're reconnecting with our Australia presenters. Yes, I am back now. Hello everybody. This is Dee. Hi. I'm hoping Hi. that Thanks Amy's back. coming back Dee. soon. Your audio sounds good. And we'll just hold on for a second for Amy, and then we'll continue. You can see, Dee, I've made you a presenter. So you'll have control again. And here's Amy. So let's go ahead and... <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Her. No problem. There's nothing You're like back. a mini let's heart attack at 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> it no does problem. do wonders for a person awake. All go right. Ahead, Amy. So, is this one of the ways that our program in professional development can fail? <laughs> it is one of the ways technology <laughs> fail. Yeah, so yeah, the asking the question of how might this fail is a great way to pinpoint places for an evaluative act activity or data collection. So um, as you're thinking about planning your um, project or program, you know, if there's a key place where you you're investing a lot of time and resources asking how that might fail uh, is a great way to think about, okay, then what might we need to be asking to make sure that we uh, don't have a fail. I'm not sure how we could avoid that with the uh, technology moment here. So um, what we're going to do next is I'm just going to, Helen is going to, and I are going to walk through some examples based on, um, based more specifically on the logic models. So. What, what, um, when Helen and I were talking through this, uh, preparing for the webinar, the way she said it to me was, Amy, I just walk backwards through the logic model, and so that's why we've added in the backwards arrows. And so in these next steps, she's just going to walk us through um, some specific examples, and I'm just going to hand it over to her to get, oh, one more thing. The basic flow of this part is she's going to do the example. We're going to have a, a question and exercise for you guys to do. Then we'll have a QA and a um, session, and then we'll just repeat that cycle. So be sure if you have questions, you're welcome to put them at any time in the chat box. Dee's taking care of that as our moderator. And that's also the place where you enter your answers for the exercise questions. So here we go. Helen, will you talk to us about uh, working backwards to identifying topics? Yes, Amy, thanks. Um, yeah. Amy and I talked about this earlier that um, when I'm looking at a project or in program management, um, even when you're tying to the need, and I know she talked about work tying that to the in, uh, impact of the outcomes, in order to see what I want, I have to work backwards to see what I have to do in order to make that next step happen. So if I'm looking at students graduating with an awareness and increased skill set and conversion, and that they're going to be excellent candidates to enter the job pipeline, I have to see what do we need to do in order to make that happen. And one piece of that is to make sure that they've got the correct technology that they're learning in their classes, and that the faculty are competent to teach that. And then you want to make sure that the faculty receive some kind of training in order to be competent to teach it. 
And then you also want to make sure that you have identified the correct topics in order for them to teach. So I know there was a question in the box about how does the business and industry tie into this. Um, and we'll get to that later in how we, uh, one way we identify topics. But that are definitely tied, among other things, on how we select topics to make sure we're picking the right ones for faculty to get training to teach students or students to get jobs in those particular areas. So that was what I was talking about. And I don't know whether you want to go to the next slide, Amy. Oh, sorry, I turned my mic off because I was having some tea. <laughs> so this is the key. Uh, my Dee just shouted at me from the other room to turn my mic on. I love it. So um, the key question here is what needs to be in place to be sure that we've got the right topics. And Helen, if you want to just talk us through what you guys do at CTC, that'd be great. Okay, and I think that's on the next slide. Yeah, so here we go. what we do is we have. We have a business and industry leadership team that they discuss. We have four meetings with them throughout the year and one day face to face, and they tell us specifically, and they're very specific on what they're looking for. We do job scope validation on what they're looking for that map the course outcome. So we're pretty clear on what they're looking for in an entry level um, employee into their business. We also survey past attendees to see what is it that you need uh, to be to get some professional development on in order to teach in the next semester, subsequent semesters. We also have birds of a feather sessions at Working Connections where they brainstorm uh, program topics. Uh, we also have um, a survey at the end of the week, well, which we're going to do a little bit more later, that would be after topics as well. So we do collate quite a bit. So then we come with this prioritized list of um, what has been suggested, and we do a lot of filters through it. We look at the number, which kind of ties to one of the questions on what if somebody comes. So we want to make sure that these are topics popular enough that need to be uh, taught and the number of people will come to it. And there are topics that the businesses say they need. So, and we also want to make sure that we have um, instructors who are qualified to come teach these topics and the materials are available. And we have lab setups available in order to do it. So there's a lot of um, filtering and a lot of assessment that we go through to make sure that we come up with the right topics. We also want to make sure we don't repeat the same topic year over year because that you're going to have some attrition rate in that as well. And uh, so you have to balance that and why that needs, needs to be refreshed. So there is an art and a science to it as well. But the evaluation data gives us a lot to do and a lot to go on. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So I'm going to turn this over to our participants and ask you all, what other processes could you or do you use when you're trying to identify good topics for this kind of pro professional development activity? And we'll give you a little time to put your answers in the chat box. Yeah. Thanks for your ideas. There's, uh, you know, getting input from students uh, and wishes of past participants or current participants. Definitely looking at uh, what industry wants, and there's a variety of ways that we can do um, get that kind of information. So I know at CTC they use the business and industry leadership team with a quarterly conference call, at least that's how it used to run. Um, and so surveying employers and other ways of engaging with industry I think can be really helpful. Uh, 
Are there is there anybody have any um, oh aggregating job listing skills is a great idea too. So I hope you guys are watching the chat box because there's lots of fun things coming up. Uh, this is the question break spot. So if you've got any burning questions or things that you want to have us say more about, this is the time to post that in the chat box. Um, Helen, do you teach faculty how to um, assess the students on the workshop content? Uh, that is not part of the training we provide, but I think that is a great suggestion. Um, we do some of that uh, survey collection as far as our partner and our college network colleges, but we have not been doing it with working connections to attendees, uh, but that's a great idea. Any other comments or questions? Uh, Elaine's posted something here in the chat box that I think is a, a really great possibility for collecting information, and that's you know you, um, people who take interns or hire your students, um, connecting directly with them to ask what kind of skills they're looking for is a great way to identify topics for curriculum and uh, for professional development. If we don't have any other uh, questions or comments, we're going to move on to the next example, which is about recruiting participants. So uh, Helen, will you do your backwards walking magic again for us? Thank you, Amy. Uh, so it's very similar to what I talked about before regarding uh, input, where you want to make sure, in this case, you want to make sure that you've got the right participants uh, who goes through your program. So if you're having faculty um, who are trained or have professional development to teach and they've completed the workshop, you want to make sure that you have the quote unquote right people in the workshop who are going to end up doing the classroom engagement and teaching students. So that's how we connect those two together. And this is an important piece as well to make sure that we have the um, right participants coming to the workshop. Mm-hmm. Yep. And if I remember right, Helen, um, CTC funds the majority of the travel, and then the the participants don't necessarily pay for the workshop. Is that right? That's right. So that's that's another good piece. With this particular activity, it can be um, a fairly expensive um, event if a person had to pay out of their pocket. We actually in our surveys ask students how much they would pay for a, a comparable training that they may get from a vendor or something like that. And it's usually 1500 to 3000 for a week, which we obviously do not charge that to community college faculty. So through our funding, we're able to provide the training for free, and we are also able to help with some travel reimbursement as well. So that's another critical reason why you want to make sure that you're getting the most bang for the buck on having the right people there at this particular activity. Mm -hmm. So will you tell us about uh, how you discovered that maybe some participants um, might not be as good in terms of bang for buck as others? Um, this is one of those things that when you do an activity or you run uh, an institute year over year, you really learn a lot of things. And that's why the logic model is really good and valuation shows you a lot. But sometimes um, you get surprise, sometimes pleasantly, and sometimes not. Uh, we've had people earlier on that signed up that were librarians. Uh, there were business people who were not adjunct faculty. Uh, people tried to sign up who were from for-profit institutions. Um, we've had all sorts of people, once they found out it's free training, wow, let's do it. So um, we had to put some measures in place to make sure that we got IT faculty from community colleges participating in this program. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here, the you know the big evaluation uh, question here is, what do we need to ask to be sure that we've got the right participants attending the professional development workshop? And uh, I think you've listed off most of these, Helen, just in um, 
describing that example. Is there anything else that you wanted to add? I'll just tell you how we do it. Um, sure. When we have registration now, we do have them identify, uh, are you an IT teacher? What do you teach? We ask for their supervisor's name and email address. We also check to make sure that the uh, registrant has a valid community college email address. Uh, we also ask at the end of the uh, event, uh, part of the top, how you plan to use it, and then we, when we do the longitudinal surveys later. But a lot of the filtering process happens at the very beginning, and we try to make sure that that sort of thing is filtered out. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, our, the network administrator, Helen, is suggesting that, oh, Dad's got a question, but what, your audio is getting a little bit rough, so we might just pause for a minute if you can uh, hang up and call back and see if we get a better connection. Okay. Okay. So we'll wait here. If you have uh, other questions or ideas, now's a good time to post them in the chat box and then we can have Helen address them when she gets back online. And I'll just move here to the chat box question, which is what criteria processes could you could help you get the right participants? So if you've got ideas that you use or things that you've thought of while uh, Helen was talking, it would be great to put those in the chat box so everybody can see them. So I'm back, Amy. Let me know when, uh, or if you can hear me okay. Oh, yeah, no, it's spectacular. That's much more clear. Okay, great. Hey, Amy, we've got a question from Max. So, uh, yep. He says, is there a trend one way or another to provide stipends for participants? You know, in ATE, Max, is that what you mean? I'm sure that's what he's asking. Okay. Yeah, he said yes uh, in the text box. Um, oh, it's taking a while for my aha. Uh -huh. Okay, there we go. Well, that I don't know. It's, Anyone I, want to weigh in on that? I think it is, from what I've seen, anyways. Yes, uh, it's fairly common. Uh, uh, Helen. <laughs> I'm sorry. Coupled no, to this, I'd, I'd like to know how they're assured that the participants do what they say they would want to do. I think a, a memorandum of agreement, for example, might be quite useful in that regard. It probably would be. Um, because we have a churn of people that uh, go through the system, we do have several who repeat year over year. We do ask about that and why you come back and so forth, but the MOU is, is an Interesting and a good idea. We do follow up, and we do have some things in place that they have to fill out the survey, and if they don't, they are taken off the invitation list. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, Helen? Because I think that's really a, a genius way that you guys have instated to make sure that people do your end of program surveys. Okay, I wasn't sure if you're going to hit that later or not, but um, yeah, well, we might not get to it. And it's a good one. Okay, uh, when they when they register, we ask them to create a four-digit uh, number. Uh, most of them use the last four digits of their social security number, but they don't have to, and they need to put a city down. Which, uh, if they want to remember it, they could use the city of their birth or any other, but they just have to remember the four digits in the city. And then when they do the survey at the end of the event, they have to put the same four digits and city down. If we map the participants of uh, doing those two mappings together and we find out someone who has not um, done the survey, then we take them off the invitation list for a year. And a Working Connections in the summer is not the only event we have. We have a shorter version in the winter for two and a half days. We also have working connections at two other locations besides uh, here at the center, so they're not invited to any of those 
four events. So there is some impact to it if they don't um, do the survey, which we do emphasize how important it is and why we need it to uh, make sure that we're doing the program correctly, we're getting the um, outcomes that we want, and that we're using the money wisely. So if they help us out and cooperate with that, they're invited back, but if they don't, they're not. Yeah, I think that is a genius idea because in my experience, getting people to respond to the survey so that you have good data to use is really critical and really tricky. Mm -hmm. So are there any uh, questions or comments about this section? We'll just take a minute in case you've got Lynn something on the chat box. Yeah, Lynn Craft had a comment in the chat box. Uh, yep. Yep. I see this identifying the critical success factors and desirable traits, I think, um, that, that's essentially what CTC has done. And um, part of what we'd like to do, in fact, I actually copied out that comment from Elaine and put it in a separate document because I think that's exactly the kind of thing that we want to identify in this fast for ATE project and see if there are common um, success factors and desirable traits across different projects so that we can help um, projects and centers develop tools that they can just use rather than having everybody's evaluator developing a similar tool and ha having PIs and project stuff um, essentially kind of reinventing the wheel for their own projects. So I think this is a great example of a place where we're hoping that on the workshop day, we'll be able to find these spots where people are, are doing this kind of work and figure out how we can make that more of a collaborative effort where we're sharing ideas and getting some good tools out of it. So any other um, comments or questions, ideas? All right. So Helen, let's do another example, shall we? I think this is the one where we're talking about more of the um, on the outcome and impact side. Yes, this is where we are looking actually are how they are using what they have learned. Um, we talked a little bit about you know asking them at the registration and so forth, but when we get to the nitty gritty, after the workshop's over and they go back to their campuses and they teach, uh, we want to make sure that that went like it was supposed to and that we have the outcomes that we want. So that's going to involve surveys after the fact or the longitudinal survey. Mm -hmm. So the key questions here is uh, what and when do we ask? to find out if faculty are actually implementing what they learn at Working Connections. And that actually aligns with something that Max answered in the chat box. So will you tell us a little bit, Helen, about how you guys do that at CTC for Working Connections? Uh, yes. We do um, three surveys during the week at Working Connections. We do a first day survey, which is really more a um, kind of a a little bit of a test at the beginning on are things working out, are you learning at the pace you want, you need to ask the instructor to slow down, that sort of thing. Uh, and so we can tell the instructor the from the get-go what modifications need to happen. Then at the end of the week, we have an overall survey where we ask some specific questions about the event, and we get a lot of data. It's about 22 questions for that survey. Then we ask a specific track survey on what they learned at their in their track and how they would um, assess their instructor on a variety of different levels. And then six months after this, after the event's over, we go back and we ask them uh, some longitudinal questions about um, you know, whether were they teaching this topic before working connections? Uh, you know, are you teaching it now? How many students have you taught? How many sections, et cetera? So we get a lot of data that way. And then over time, and we probably did this going back to working connections about five years ago, we actually mapped this over time, a year by year, to see how this is tracking with each working connections we've had. So 12 months later, we'll do another one. So that's an 18 months after the fact. And then another uh, 12 months after that, and, and so forth, until it's about five years. And then at some point, we feel like there's diminishing returns because you have turnover of faculty, the technology has changed. You know, so many factors that at a certain point, we just don't think that is going to be that valuable. Okay. 
it looks like Amy and Dee both dropped off again, but I think they're back on. Okay, good. Yeah. Helen, uh, could I ask you to tell us a bit about the, the survey that you do within the program, the instruction itself? What happens when you find the instruction is going bad, or the instructor is going bad? It hasn't happened very often, but it does happen occasionally. And I will say, we learn a lot more when things go wrong than when things go right. If we find out on the first day, and sometimes we've done a third day survey as well, that the instructor even either on topics like they should, we have coached them, we have talked to them after hours, we've had some team teaching involved, we've done a variety of things. I'll, I'll give you an example. One time we had someone who was really, really good, and he was from a university, and he taught um, security classes, uh, and he came highly recommended. However, he was used to teaching very young students at the university, and he was not well equipped to teach people of a more mature level, uh, as we see a working connection. So there was a little bit of an instructor um, class participant disconnect there. And we worked with them some to do a little bit more of the hands-on that they wanted. Um, you know, there had to be kind of a compromise. And at the end of the week, we pretty much mutually agreed this was just not the best venue for him to teach. Um, so we've had a variety of things that we do intervene. We just don't let, you know, somebody dangle, and we don't let the class flounder either. Um, so we will intervene in those cases. Coupled to that, when, when you uh, do these follow-up surveys and you find that somebody is not implementing or not responding, uh, does that happen frequently? And do you find that the follow-up really increases activity among your participants? I think it does, Arlen. Um, we do find some follow-up. And uh, when we look at it, we can tell and see if they have changed uh, colleges and so forth. It's very difficult sometimes if you have a one-off person who's come to one event and you don't see them, you know, again at another working connection. If we have repeat attendees, it's much easier to track and follow up with them. Uh, so, and we don't want to eliminate, you know, someone who's just going to come one time because it's always good to have fresh blood, and maybe all they needed was that one class. So this is a little different than you have maybe faculty in a partner college or a college who's in your community of practice and you have an ongoing relationship, and you keep that up year over year over year, people would come to this event, may come one time only, use it for a semester or two, and perhaps they are not called upon to teach that class again after that first year. So there are just many factors that um, are involved in it. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know if Amy and Dee are back again. I, I think we could probably advance the slide here. Um, yeah, I was going to say I can talk to the next slide. There we go. Sure. So this is a little bit of what I had mentioned about um, you described. So we asked them at Working Connections, what was your level of expertise before the week began? How would you set your level now? And we gave them four choices. Um, uh, will you or have you taught the course? And we get that from a longitudinal survey. Uh, they're also very interested in how many courses degrees they have created or modified based on what they learned at Working Connections. And um, how many students do you have uh, who've taken your classes and what have they done with it, you know, since they've taken the class? There's some pretty strong parallels there with what you do in the annual survey for uh, the ATE program, if my memory serves me. Yes, yeah, so that is uh, very fortuitous because it gives us data that helps us out in that regard as well. I and mean, it's so interesting when we attend webinars like this or if we see there's new ways that the um, annual assessment ATE survey is done. It gives us some good ideas along with what uh, we discussed with our evaluator on things that we can be looking for that will help us make some improvements. Mm -hmm. So yes, there's that tie-in. Great. Let's, um, let's flip to the next slide, I think. Um, now you do require uh, these surveys to be completed. You mentioned that earlier, I think. Yes, that's, that's Yes, and that's what I said with the four-digit code in the city. Uh, and we actually do have a no-fly list <laughs> because we have working connections in three different locations. And we do compare our attendee list with each other. And so when they're on the no-fly list, they're on the no-fly list for all of them. Great, great. 
think we've got a question break here coming up next. Um, I have a question. Um, you know, how do you how do you actually get the information on student starts and completions? And how do you collect that information? Oh, that's interesting. Um, we that's interesting uh, that we discussed that before with this particular group. I I got my surveys uh, mixed up a little bit. We do that with surveys of our partner colleges and our colleges and our convergence college network because we have a year over year long term relationships with them that we can get that data. It's a little bit more difficult with the Working Connections Longitudinal Survey participants, although there is overlap with some of those audiences. But I think that's a great idea and we're going to look into seeing how we can do that. Thanks, Helen. We also have a question here um, from Arlen actually. How do you get assessment information to know if students have learned the material? So right now it's probably more anecdotal than anything, um, but I think that would be good for us to provide the faculty some common um, survey questions that they could have with their courses so we can gather that data as well. So that was an excellent point uh, that you brought up as well. Great. Are there Thank others, you very much. Are there others in the group that that have questions? I don't know that we asked them to uh, pose questions to, to Helen. Yes, please feel free to um, type out in the chat box any questions you may have right now. Well, if you do throughout the next section, I will um, make note of them and then we can um, pose them at a later time. Um, and shall I head back to you, Amy? Are you back online? I need you to turn your mic on, Amy. Okay, my mic's on now. Hi, everyone. Excellent. I'm back. Uh, thanks for your patience. Well, Dee and I apparently experience only the like international dateline problem where we keep dropping in and out. I think um, based on what I heard as we were going in and out, we uh, Helen may have covered this a little bit in terms of identifying presenters and um, making sure that they're delivering well during the um, working connections. Is that right? Yes. OK. Yes. yes, we touched on that a little bit because we do have an assessment from the folks that attend uh, on several levels, how well they're doing. That helps us determine if we want to invite them back. Amy, are you with us? Yep. Yep. So this is, um, I just want to run quickly through these slides. So thinking about key sources of information and criteria for choosing your presenters. And if I heard the bits that Helen was talking about, the surveys that they do throughout uh, Working Connections and then again at the end. So the stuff that happens during working connections makes it possible for them to directly talk to the presenters and see if they can get fixes done in real time. And then the ratings at the end uh, give them a list of presenters that they can use at, at the other institutes that they do around the country. Is there anything you want to add to that, Helen? No, that's, that's that's about it. We do have this um, speakers bureau list that we keep the um, the name of the instructor, what they've taught before, when they taught it, um, the rating that they had. We keep a lot of data on everybody who's done that, so we have a pretty good sense of how well they're going to do. And we also have the supplemental list on keynote speakers as well. So it helps us a lot when we're doing things in different uh, geographic locations to make some suggestions and come up with some vetted people. Okay. Great. So I just want to take a minute to recap. This is I think we've run through ooh, we've run through all our examples. Um, so is there anybody who wants to offer some key points in the project where you can collect data to improve it while it's running? So questions you might want to ask in the midst of a curriculum development or, or professional development or some of the other things. Are there key spots? in that development or delivery process where you think that it would be good to do some data collection. I 
I think this is one of those, uh, another one of those places where lots of people are doing lots of great things. And what we hope to do with this project is to be able to surface a whole bunch of those and see if we can uh, create some synergy around that. So some sharing of resources and some good tools as a result. So I can see a couple of people are writing in the chat box. We'll just wait to hear from, well, I guess to read. Yep, the pre-post workshop, those are really good. I think um, Helen's idea, too, of using the um, applications as a way to get data is a good one as well. Yep. Yeah, so pretty often, uh, as Elaine has mentioned, it gets, you build those around specific events. So if you've got uh, a place where you're doing professional development activity or after you've done a professional activity, a development activity, spacing those out uh, with some follow-up surveys after can be really helpful. I mean, I don't, so there's somebody else put it in the chat box. Yep. Focus groups are a great idea if you're in the development phase. And at, in uh, at CTC, we've got, um, they do that, I think, with the business and industry leadership team. So making sure that yeah, we also, they use that. Yeah, we also did a focus group, I need mean, with a long time attendees. Um, we took them hmm. aside in a, in a room and we asked them some specific questions about, you know, why did they come? Why do they keep coming back? Uh, what are they getting out of it, et cetera, to kind of um, help us understand why we have returnees and why we might have some turnover with those who are not. Mm -hmm. yeah, great. Any other comments or questions that you want to post in the chat box? I can see one person's entering a chat message here, so I'm just going to wait for a second and see if we'll get that to come up. I feel like my chat box is slower than everyone else's chat box. All right. So what I'd like to do is I'm just going to spin back through these slides. and. Um, for those of you who are coming to the workshop and for those of you who are just thinking about how to embed this evaluation more into your project, I'm going to hop back to uh, one of these logic model slides and just walk that, do that backwards logic again. So as we said, you know, the logic model essentially is the if-then logic that works in this direction. So if we have these inputs, then we can create these activities, which will then generate these outputs, these outcomes, and this impact. So when we're doing, um, using the logic model to generate evaluation, activities and data and questions, then we're starting here with the impact, which is connected to the needs. And we're backtracking our way through to say, OK, so if we have, um, if we're going to have meet the industry's need, we need to have students who are prepared. And in order to have students who are prepared, we need to have that technology uh, being taught in the classroom by people who know what they're doing and who have uh, done training and have curriculum and instruction materials that they can uh, use, which are the outputs here. So the, you've got the faculty that have done it, they've got the assessments, and they come from Working Connections. And then the question is, what do we need to put into Working Connections to make sure that we can get to those outcomes? So um, I hope this is helpful in terms of thinking through um, the sort of the forwards and backwards way that logic models can be used for this kind of task. And as I think we were able to highlight a little bit earlier, there's several of these places um, in project streams, you know, streams of activity like professional development and materials development where we're going to have, we hope, some of these really key nodes that come up in our conversations at the workshop that we'll be able to highlight and then move through. So at this point, uh, let me get to the end here. I'm going to flip over to Dee and she's going to um, say thanks 
and give you some directions about what's going to happen here in the next couple of minutes. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Amy. I hope everybody can hear me and we're not having any more technical difficulties. Um, well, this wraps up the webinar for those of you who will not be attending the workshop. Um, in just a second, we're going to show you the slide with the survey link. There is a technical hiccup here in that we move away, if we move away from the survey slide, it closes the survey. Since we want to hear from you on the survey and we want to have an opportunity for a final Q&A and we need to talk to our workshop participants afterwards, we are just going to multitask. While the survey slide is up, we'll do a final Q&A. When that wraps up, we'll move on to give the workshop attendees a quick overview of the workshop. So if you'd like to fill oh if you'd like to fill the survey at a later date, you can copy the link provided on the next slide. You can cut and paste it from the chat box where Mike will post it. Um, that's your cue, Mike. Or you can get it from the webinar handout, which we'll send uh, next week. Thanks again for being with us today. We will post a recording of this webinar on the Evalu Evaluate um, website. Is that correct, Amy? Yep. It'll probably take us till next week to get it up because it takes a little bit for us to get the recording and then change the format so we can post it on the web. But the, uh, the link that you followed to register, the page where you could get to that uh, link to register for the webinar, is where the video link will appear. So it's going to be archived the way that all of the Evaluate webinars are archived. So while we're waiting for the survey to come up, do we have any other questions or comments? We'd love to hear from you about those these key places that you've identified in your projects where evaluation can really be helpful for improving things as you go. Yep, while well, we're just giving a little space to finish the survey. Uh, right, so the slides will be posted on the Evaluate website. So we'll have the slides and the webinar video will be up there next week. And for those of you who are participating in the workshop, we'd ask for you to just hang around for another couple of minutes and we're going to do a quick o overview of the workshop day and the uh, plan for that and then have a chance for you guys to ask us any questions you've got about logistics or whatever to make sure that we're ready to go. And also while we're waiting, I just want to take the time to say thanks to Helen for uh, making time in her day to talk with us about what's happening at CTC and the ways that they've identified these important sort of nodes for evaluation activities and data collection. So thanks, Helen. Thank you, Amy. I've picked up some ideas myself. Thank you. Thanks for everybody who gave suggestions. Well, I hope it's gone well. I'm finally back. My info disappeared. This is Arlen. Welcome back. Oh, thanks. Yep. Is there anyone? Else? All right. I think we are uh, ready to move on to the next slide and close the survey.
Thanks everyone for participating and uh, we're going to move on to the Q&A for our workshop participants now. And I will hand you over to um, Amy and Arlen. All right. So uh, the plan for the workshop today is that we're going to um, break you into streams for like groups, which is why on the survey we asked you to indicate your levels of preference for those um, areas. And um, hopefully my life will not be too crazy in the next couple of weeks and we'll be able to show, uh, t essentially tell you what group we've assigned you to so that you can do a little bit of thinking and planning along those lines. So these are the light groups that we're thinking about. If you, um, you know, if after thinking about it, you've got one that you know that you're really committed to and you want to be sure that you're in that group, just send D or I an email and we'll track that. Uh, in terms of our main task and the outcomes we're after for the workshop, these are the basic things we're going to do during the day. So. Um, you will be able to, if you bring your logic model, with those of you who haven't done one yet, we'd ask that you send us one so that everybody's kind of starting on the same page. So during the workshop day, you'll get to review your logic model alongside other people, uh, other projects that are working in similar areas. And so you'll get some ideas for refining your logic model. Um, for us, in terms of the projects, we're going to get a whole set of logic models um, for these different stream areas and we'll take a little bit of time during the workshop to identify some uh, some of the key things that are happening in each of those characteristic areas. We're also going to um, do a similar activity to what we did today where we're looking at what are the key uh, events, key timings, key tools uh, for evaluative activities and data collection. So um, from that piece, you'll definitely get ideas for your projects from the other people at your table and from the group that's assembled. And our a task from that is to put together that high level set of evaluation activities and data needs in these different project stream areas. What we'll ask you to do is help us prioritize. So which of those are the most important for us to um, follow up on first thing in terms of looking at tools and building systems? So that'll help um, you all think about, too, what are the priorities for your projects, because we know that even if there's lots of great ideas about um, evaluation data collection, that there's definitely a feasibility issue, and you have to decide um, what data you can actually afford to collect. So um, helping you think about what are the key priorities for you in terms of evaluation uh, activities and data collection, and then giving to FAST for ATE, uh, that prioritized high level list and our hope is that those of you who come to the workshop and folks who are interested who aren't able to attend will be able to put together some collaborative groups or um, group depending on how things work out that we could uh, put together for writing proposals for the next phase. And the last piece is that we've got two great keynote speakers who are going to be joining us for the day and they're going to give you, my guess is, lots of ideas for your project and for us we're just really pleased to be able to connect you with them. And I'm going to hand over to Dad to just tell you a little bit about uh, Janet and John. Uh, or for those of you, and probably most of you, aren't so familiar with Dr. Clinton, she uh, runs the Evaluation Center at Melbourne, which is the place where Amy works. Amy reports directly to her, and she's, I think, one of the world's best in, in evaluation, and in particular, she knows and works with logic models and advocates their use a lot, so she'll have many ideas in that regard. John Handy, I hope most, if not all, of you know of him if you haven't met him or talked, listened to him directly. He's probably best known for his major book on uh, visible learning, which is a meta uh, study. It's a synthesis of over 800 meta analyses on the uh, territory of teaching and assessment practices. and. Uh, I've interacted with him uh, quite a bit over the past year, and every time I read his materials, I learn something more. And I think you're going to see some strong 
parallels between classroom assessment practices and project assessment uh, to improve the quality of your evaluation. So I'm delighted that they're willing to come and talk with us, and I think, as Amy has said, uh, we'll learn a lot from them. All right, so uh, we have a to-do list for you. Just, this is in the letter that you've gotten from us, but I wanted to just highlight it here. If you haven't uh, completed the pre-workshop survey. My guess is most of you have. We just had a few people who hadn't. Um, attending the webinar, which most of you have done, so you can tick that box, as they say down here. Uh, if you haven't done this yet, please make your hotel reservations at the Omni, um, Omni Shoreham, and do that under the ATEPI conference. Uh, they'll, they'll bill fast for ATE, but the booking needs to be made under the ATEPI conference just because there's not a specific um, set of rooms designated just for our project. So we'd also like you to just double check if you haven't, or read if you haven't, the logistics instructions for participants because it has what you need to know about the hotel and the other things there. If you haven't already sent us the logic model, we'd appreciate it if you would do that. If you want to wait until we get you assigned to a stream and then just do that sort of drill down more in-depth version for the stream that you're assigned to, that's absolutely fine. Um, and if you want to send us a high level one, that can work too. Um, also make sure that you save the per diem request form so that you can get reimbursed for your per diems, uh, your, your food while you're uh, in Washington for the conference. So we'll be at the Omni Shoreham Capital Room. I'm not actually sure that's the Capital Room, but it probably looks something like that. Yeah, I agree, Dad. Uh, on, on this, make a hotel reservation at the Omni under ATEPI conference. I want to make sure that uh, you, you know that you don't pay the hotel bill. Uh, that hotel bill will be paid by Fast for ATE, and uh, it gets to be problematic if you pay it. So, if you have other, if you have room service or some other things, you'll need to pay those kinds of bills. But the main hotel room itself should be uh, paid for by Fast for ATE, not you. Um, there are a whole set of reasons, including tax reasons, that needs to be paid for by. Uh, the project rather than than you individually. So if they give you if they give, give you trouble on it, uh, let us know or tell them to get in touch with me or um, say, well, I think there's an error here. Thanks. Yeah. Yep. So we'll be uh, in the Capitol Room at the Omni Showroom from 8.30 to 5 on the Tuesday. So we're expecting you to arrive on the Monday before, and then um, we're again covering your hotel for Monday and Tuesday night, so then you can be there for the start of the PI conference on Wednesday. Uh, we just want to check in here to see if anybody has any special needs um, that we haven't already covered in the survey. So we've got your food rules. And we'll we'll be or making sure that our order uh, can accommodate those in terms of catering. So let me inspect yep. the struggling with with yeah, the folks at Omni in, in terms of food. So I'm hoping it turns out well, but right now it's problematic. All right. Adventures in catering. So uh, these three people are folks that have uh, expressed interest. We offered them a spot, and we just haven't heard from them for the last 10 days. So if anybody out there knows how to get a hold of them via something other than email, that would be fantastic. Um, we, we just appreciate your assistance, because if we can't hear from them, we've got a waiting list, and we're going to offer their spots to other people, and we would want them to miss out if it's just some sort of technical issue. So. Yep, we'll try to let you know if, if the catering thing doesn't work out, Jan. Thanks for posting that. So this is the time for you to post anything that's not clear about what we've got uh, lined up for the workshop day. Uh, any questions or concerns you've got, we just wanted to make sure that we had time for you to, to get those answered while we had the community space here.
pretty quiet. Yeah, no. Perhaps we communicate more clearly than we realize. But I sort of doubt it. <laughs> uh, Amy, we've got a question from Elaine. Yep. Yeah, Elaine, we'll, we'll talk with you about that when we have our advisory committee call on the 10th of October. So we'll do, we will have um, a bit more for facilitators to do at the, on the day. I'm just taking a spin through here to see if we've got anybody else. Uh, <laughs> yep. Yep, we're looking forward to seeing you guys too. This is really exciting. We've been building up uh, to this for a year, so we're looking forward to having a chance to do the work together. If you have questions uh, that you forgot to ask today or for some reason can't get through the electronics to get to us, uh, please drop us a note. Yep, you can email D or I anytime. Email D or me anytime. We're happy to get back to you and answer your questions. Looks like things are pretty quiet out there on the uh, chat box front, so I feel like we could call it a day or a night, depending on. Which yeah, I think so. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Thank everybody, for participating, and we're looking forward to seeing you in October. Thank you, Amy. Yep. Thanks, everyone. So long. Bye-bye. Farewell. I'll feed her saying I do. So, Amy and Dee, that officially uh, ends the webinar. Now the folks on the attendees can still hear us since we're still connected to the system. Okay. I apologize for a couple of the audio glitches here. Um, but, you know, you guys worked it through it, and I'm glad to see that you logged back in. So that's good. Yeah. Plus, Dad and Gordon, you know, pretty well. Yeah. And <laughs> anything final from you, Amy? Remember, we're still connected live to the audience. Nope. I'm good. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate okay. it. How about you? You're all set? Yeah, all set. Thank you very much for all your help. Good. Arlen, I, I'm glad you were able to get back in. Thanks for uh, for jumping in there. You're still on with us, Arlen? Okay, I think he's logged out now. He's I see run that away. He's and Gordon, thank you for thank you, Gordon, for pitching in there and picking up as as we uh, resolved our audio problems. So thank you for that. Yeah, I thought it was really good. It was a good. It was a, it was a great uh, great webinar. Yeah. Good Thanks, job. Gordon. I, I like I like uh, Helen. She talks fast, but that's good. <laughs> <laughs> and Southern. <laughs> Yes, right, right, okay. All right, folks, uh, to all of our participants who are still maybe just in the process of logging out, thank you. And uh, Amy, Dee, Arlen, Gordon, looking forward to seeing you uh, in D.C. for this workshop. Yeah. So that's going to stop the recording for right now.